Welcome back to Chapter 8, Estimating with Confidence. This is the beginning of Section 8.3, and we're shifting into estimating a population mean. In the previous section, we estimated a population proportion, uh, so we'll be looking at estimating mu by using our point estimate of x bar. So after the section, we should be able to state and check for randomness. So again, just like the last section, we're looking to see that we did sample from an SRS. We're looking to satisfy the 10% condition. So again, establishing independence uh, through that 10 times the sample size is less than or equal to our population. And then we're going to establish normality uh, through our large sample condition. Uh, so again, uh, establishing normality here. Uh, is if the population distribution is known to be uh, normal, our sampling distribution will be normal. Uh, if we do not know what the population distribution looks like, again, we're hoping that we have a large enough sample uh, that will have a sample size that's greater than or equal to 30, so we can use the central limit theorem. Uh, we'll also look at explaining how T distributions, so that would be something new here. So we're looking at T distributions uh, are different from the standard normal distribution and why it's necessary to use the T distribution when calculating out a confidence interval for a population mean. So in other words, we'll find out, uh, you know, when, when do we use these T distributions. We'll determine critical values again. Uh, so uh, the last chapter it was Z stars, uh, so we'll be looking at, because uh, we're using a T distribution, we'll be looking at calculating a T star uh, for this section. And we'll be using a, a new table, it will be table B, um, and then technology resources uh, are available in Launchpad uh, as tech corners at the top of the uh, chapter in the, uh, um, on the online textbook. We'll construct and again interpret, construct and interpret, in other words make our conclusion uh, uh, based on a confidence interval for a population mean. And then we'll do what we did last time too in section 8.2 in the second video is determine that sample size. Again determine what is the appropriate n to, uh, to take for a stated confidence interval and a specified margin of error. Okay, So the big issue here in section 8.3 is the sigma, the population standard deviation is unknown. This is actually more likely than actually knowing what the population uh, standard deviation is. So this is where we're going to use T distributions. So this is what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about this. So um, as a review, when we do, when we have sampling distributions of X bar, uh, when it's close to normal, we can find probabilities by X bar by standardizing. So in other words, this is our standard uh, z-score formula of our uh, observation minus the population divided by our standard deviation. But the key thing is, is this guy right here many times is just not known. Okay. Um, so uh, when we look at the sampling distribution uh, of X bar, again, that is our best estimate. This X bar here, the mean of the X bars, is our best estimate uh, of that population mean. Um, our standard deviation is the sigma divided by the square root of n. Yeah, if you take these values up here and we standardize them, it should be standardized so we have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. That's how we know when we have a standard normal curve, so we've got a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. But again, like I said, we don't know that sigma. We don't know what that sigma is many, many times. So our best estimate of that, well, would be a sample standard deviation of uh, those x's. So the question is what happens when we standardize when we use this value when we have this as part of our standard error uh, on the bottom of our z-score rather than the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. 
Well, when we standardize based on the sample standard deviation of uh, S sub X, our statistic has a new distribution called a T distribution. So in other words, when we're, when we're using uh, this in our uh, standard Z score, uh, we're going to use a T distribution rather than a Z distribution. It does have a different shape than the standard normal curve. Though it is symmetric with a single peak at zero, however it has a much it has much more area on the tails. So as we look at the distribution, here's a T distribution. We've got a little bit more area on the tails as opposed to a Z distribution that's a little bit tighter a little bit higher peak and has very little area on the tails. But like any standard statistic, the T tells us how far X bar is from its mean mu in standard deviation units. So again, we looked at you know how far away Z units would be away uh, from that mean. Uh, T does the same thing. It's how many standard units are away from that mean. So we could have a T out here. Uh, again, that's you know how many units uh, from our from our mean. There is a different t distribution for each sample size, uh, so uh, we'll illustrate that in, in a few minutes here. Uh, but we uh, have to again understand what degrees of freedom are. Okay, so uh, we have to learn how to uh, take an account when you have different sample sizes, how that will change our T distribution based on our degrees of freedom. <coughs> so when we perform inference about a population mean using a T distribution, the appropriate degrees of freedom are found by subtracting one from the sample size. So in other words, our degrees of freedom are always N minus one, and that should be recalled from a previous chapter uh, that we've done that before too. Okay? So kind of the way we'll write that degrees of freedom when we use a T distribution is the following t sub n minus 1. So if I draw an SRS of size n from a large population that has a normal distribution, so again that population has a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, the statistic t, that's, it's not a z score anymore, it's a t score, uh, is found by doing the following, taking that uh, x bar minus our mean, or population mu mean, uh, divided by S sub X, our uh, sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Uh, so again, our T distribution with degrees of freedom of N minus 1. So that's kind of important because that's going to show us how to use table B uh, in our packet of, of uh, tables that we have. Okay, Here's a key statement here. When the population distribution isn't normal, the statistic will have approximately a t sub n minus 1 distribution if the sample size is large enough. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit more. When comparing the density curves of the standard normal distribution and t distribution, several facts are apparent. The density curves of the t distributions are similar in shape to the standard normal distribution. So they still look like that common bell curve. The spread of the T distribution is a bit greater than that of the standard normal distribution. So you can see here the dotted red line, uh, the kind of aqua colored blue line has a little bit higher uh, values over the tails. Uh, so uh, that spread will be a little bit further. But you also notice that that peak is not quite as high as well. Okay. So as I said here, the T distributions have more probability in the tails and less in the center. So what I like to think of is the standard normal curve, the purple curve right here, uh, and compared to the T distribution, the T distributions are kind of smooshed down. The tops uh, uh, are less in the center, but have a little bit more in the tails. So as the degrees of freedom increase, as we go from a smaller increase, so it was a, uh, a sample size of 2 to 9 you know, to 20 uh, to 30. As we start increasing that sample size, you can see here like this red curve when it's got, a, when it's got two degrees of freedom. 
is when the uh, aqua one here is nine degrees of freedom. So in other words, that's a sample size uh, of three. That's a sample size of 10. We can see that that curve slowly starts to approach that normal. And I bet you you can guess about at what point it gets very, very close to being normal. So let's put this into practice. Look at a problem here. You, when we'll use table B to find the critical T star values. The critical T star values. So I want to be able to find a 95% confidence interval based on a simple random sample of size n equals 12. There's a key there. We're going to have to find our degrees of freedom for that. Okay. So our degrees of freedom are 12 minus 1 or 11. Now we go to table B, and this is just a little uh, uh, clipping of table B. We'd go down on the left side until we get to 11 degrees of freedom. And then if I'm in a 95% confidence interval, again, we need to remember that 95% confidence, we want that middle part here to be 95%, which leaves us 0 0.025 in each tail. So we'll look for the upper tail probability. So we're looking up there, that upper tail probability is 0 0.025. That's why we look at the top on that part. We've got the degrees of 11, degrees of freedom of 11. So we cross-reference that 2.201 is our T star. That's our critical value. A 90% confidence interval of a random sample of 48 observations. Okay, so we want to look at what critical T value from table B should be used. So we've got 48 observations. We want to find the T star critical value for degrees of freedom of 47. Again, 48 minus 1, because if we had 48 observations, N minus 1, uh, we're going to look up 47. But the problem is there's no 47 on the table. Okay, this table starts to go from 30 to 40 to 50. Well, the common rule is to be a little more conservative and to round down to the lowest, uh, the lower one, and use 40 here rather than the 50. And again, with a 90% confidence interval, you would have that 90% in, in between here, so you'd have 0 0.05 in each of the tails. The upper tail is 0 0.05, 40 degrees of freedom. We cross-reference and have our T star of 1.684. So conditions for estimating mu, uh, as with proportions, you should check some important conditions. And those conditions are randomness. So again, make sure that uh, we're taking uh, from a well-designed random sample, an SRS. Make sure that we are checking the 10% condition for independence. And that we can use our standard deviation that we were uh, calculating before. And then also make sure that we are assessing normality. And again, if the population has a normal distribution or if the sample size is large, uh, that's the central limit theorem that allows us to use the normal curve and to use normal calculations. But if the population distribution has an unknown shape, so it's an unknown shape, we don't know if the population is normal and our sample size is less than 30, what you should do is you should graph the sample data. Yeah, and then if the graph, if that graph looks normal, we can assume normality uh, because our sample data should reflect the population data. Okay? But do not, do not use T procedures if that graph, if the graph of the sample data that we just had is not normal. Uh, if it shows strong skewness or outliers. We'll address what to do when that happens in future lessons. Uh, but for right now, um, we should be able to assess normality, uh, that if it comes from a normal distribution, our sample should be normal. If our sample size is large, it's, and which means it's greater than 30, we can use a central limit theorem. Um, if the population distribution uh, it has an unknown shape and it's less than 30, graph the data, and then you can go ahead and use uh, the T distribution if our sample data is normal. All right, that should be it for the first day of Lesson 8.3. We'll see you in the next video.